Hello and welcome to Auto Shenanigans. How the devil are you? Have you had a good week? My name is John. Thank you very much for joining me for another exciting episode of Secrets of the Motorway. In today's episode, I've come to Merseyside where we find the start of the 19 mile long M53 motorway. The M53 came about as the result of a merger between two entirely different motorway projects and it poses questions such as why is Junction 2 so vastly over-engineered, what's this weird thing at Junction 5 and what's all this about the M531? Don't worry, I have all the answers and more. Let's get on. Junction 1, which is also known as Bidston Island, opened in 1972 along with the first section of the M53 which ran from here down to Junction 5. Its main feature is the 730 metre long Bidston Moss Viaduct which carries the motorway over the A554 and the Birkenhead to New Brighton Railway. In 2005, a vehicle weight limit was imposed on the viaduct because its structure was beginning to fail. Following that, matters didn't really improve and without remedial works, the viaduct would have to be closed to heavy traffic. 88.5 million pounds and 1.25 million person hours later, in 2011, the viaduct was sorted and could have its weight limit finally removed. Between junctions 1 and 2, the A553 or Fender Lane crosses over the motorway. This road had to be realigned due to the motorway's construction and in doing so, there's an abandoned road bridge left over for us to look at. Before the motorway was built, Fender Lane would have followed this route where it crosses over the railway before entering the town of Bidston. Junction 2, the vastly over-engineered junction. Well, it is in the context of what it connects up to. A short half-mile motorway spur that takes you up to Junction 2A, which is nothing more than a roundabout and the end of the line. Back to Junction 2, and it's fair to say that as junctions go, it's pretty decent with free-flowing access in all directions, and wouldn't it be great if all junctions had this level of effort put into them? It's just a shame that they put all of the effort into Junction 2 of the M53 because it serves little to no purpose. No doubt at this point you're expecting me to say that the spur road from Junction 2 is the result of a cancelled motorway project and a waste of money. But no, it's just a waste of money. I can't find any solid plans or evidence to suggest that the motorway was going to continue from Junction 2A to anywhere, so it's all a bit of a mystery. Junction 3 is another wonderfully over-engineered junction that features a flyover that carries the A552 right over the whole thing. They didn't need to build the junction like this, but they did, and it's a textbook example of one of the better junction designs. Just before Junction 4 and the motorway passes through an old abandoned road, and if we follow this road along we begin to realise that it's part of a larger network of roads with what appears to be an old roundabout. It isn't a roundabout, but it is old. The road network, or should I say tree-lined avenues, was installed between 1912 and 1914, and it belonged to the nearby Thornton Manor estate. The network of roads was built all over the Thornton estate, adding up to around five miles worth. The manor house itself was built a bit earlier in the 1880s, and for a short while was owned by William Lever. Do you remember him from the M61 episode? He's the guy with the fake castles who would then go on to create the giant corporation Unilever. Just before you get to Junction 5, keep an eye out for the ghost slip roads that hint towards other ideas for this motorway. It's at this point that the carriageway splits into two before realigning for Junction 5. What's the deal here? Perhaps predictably, it's the result of a cancelled motorway. The original idea for the M53 was very different to what we have today. Had it been built as intended, it would have seen the M53 head south at Junction 5 to link up with the M56. Interestingly, using data from the British Geological Society, we can see where borehole surveys were carried out in the late 60s, and this gives us some idea as to what route the motorway might have taken. With that all in mind, Junction 5 was supposed to be where the M53 would meet another motorway, the M531, and it's why the carriageway splits just before before the junction. Had the motorway and junction been built as planned, these would have been the connecting slip roads to the M531. So why was it all cancelled? In short, the local council ran out of money, so they approached the government for financial assistance, which they didn't get. So that was the end of all of that. So what's this M531 motorway all about then? Well, the M531 was a motorway that was built in 1975 and it ran between junctions 5 and 10 of today's M53. Let's add in the M53 as per the original plan and we can see how this was all supposed to work. Of course, with the M53 extension cancelled, it was a case of stitching the two motorways together at junction 5. And for a few years, both motorways would remain in place, making for an odd situation where you would just transition from one motorway to the other. In 1981, they renumbered the M531 section to become part of the M53. It smells like a chemical toilet around here. After Junction 5, the M53 split personality disorder rears its ugly head. It's fair to say that the M53 is really made up of two different sections, the first being the original M53 and the second being the M531. 
The first section, as we've discovered, has nicely over-engineered junctions, smooth curves, and generally speaking, is a nice bit of motorway. The second section, previously the M531, is the complete opposite of that, and it's quite clear that from junction 5 onwards, the motorway follows a very different design brief. From this point onwards, it's tightly packed junctions and tight curves, surrounded by buildings and industrial estates, a stark contrast to the open-winding M53 found before junction 5. Junction 6 arrives immediately after junction 5, and okay, I know that sounds obvious, but what I mean is that they actually share slip roads due to their close proximity to one another. Now, I'm pretty sure that that's against motorway regulations, but as always, the story behind that is complicated. It's actually down to the M531. It was built as an unclassified road rather than a motorway, so it doesn't really follow any of the official motorway regulations. As a result, junctions 5 and 6 seem to share a slip road, and they're only about a third of a mile apart from one another. Anyway, back to junction 6, and this junction was put in place more or less to serve Vauxhall Motors and the Eastham Oil Terminal. Vauxhall Motors have had a production plant here since the 1960s, and despite job loss, and threats of closure over the years, they've managed to soldier on and they now manufacture things like the Vauxhall Combo E-Van and the Citroen Berlingo E-Van, whatever. The Citroen E-Berlingo. The site was originally an RAF airfield. RAF Hooton Park was built in 1917 as a training airfield but saw closure in 1957. For a while, Shell used the leftover runways for high-speed vehicle testing before the site was purchased by Vauxhall or General Motors. Despite the area now being a complete myriad of different industries, if you have a look around, you'll spot the odd remains of the World War II airfield. Just to the north of Junction 6 is a leftover World War II B1 hangar, and there are sections of runway and taxiway as well. And closer to Junction 6 is a set of three hangars that were built in World War I. The three hangars have been preserved thanks to the Hooton Park Trust, who took the initiative in the 80s to preserve this rare collection of Belfast Trust buildings. They were under the ownership of Vauxhall Motors, who perhaps didn't realise the historical importance of these buildings because they were looking to get rid of them. After a few years of discussion, the three hangars were handed over to the Trust, I think for no cost, which is very nice of Vauxhall. Just by Junction 7, poking out of the treetops, is a water tower. This water tower sits on the site of the former Bridgewater paper mill, which covered an area of 52 acres. It was constructed in the mid-1930s, right on the banks of the Manchester Shipping Canal. In its later years, the mill was producing around 220,000 tonnes of recycled paper a year, but with a steady decline in printed media sales due to consumers moving over to digital formats, announced that they would close in 2010. All the staff were made redundant and the buildings demolished to make way for some shiny new warehouses. Mm. But there is one survivor from the paper mill, the water tower. It's managed to gain grade 2 listed status and is also home to several radio masts and antennas, so I assume it won't be going anywhere anytime soon, and until it does, it shall serve as a landmark for drivers on the M53. The section of motorway running between junctions 10 and 12 will be the last section of M53 to be built, opening in 1981. Until that point, we had the M531, which would have terminated here at junction 10. At the time of building Junction 10, space was left over for a motorway extension to be built, and they did build it. A flyover was installed at Junction 10, and the motorway continued south down to Junction 12. But hiding underneath the flyover is a section of the A5117 road that used to run through here before the motorway came along. It's a bit harder to see, but there's also the remains of Mill Lane that used to connect up with the A5117 here. We're going off script a little bit here, but the leftover piece of road is now used as an illegal dumping ground by twats. It's absolutely minging. Look, people will dump all kinds of shit these days. There's old mattresses, old sofas, old baths, building rubble, Saabs. At Junction 11, the M53 meets the M56 at the Stoke Interchange. If you're on the M53, you're only able to join the M56 heading in an eastbound direction, unless that is you're an authorised vehicle and are able to make use of the sneaky slip road that'll put you on the westbound carriageway. There's also the Shropshire Union Canal running right through the interchange. It was built in 1835 and it starts back at Ellesmere Port and runs down to Shrewsbury. The canal found here at Junction 11, as I said, starts up at Ellesmere Port, which is also where you'll find the National Waterways Museums. Junction 12 is where the M53 comes to an end. The motorway, or should I say road, does continue here. It becomes the A55. <laughs> A55, looks like ass. <laughs> the junction itself opened in 1982, marking the last piece of the M53 puzzle, but the flyover that carries the A55 wouldn't come until 10 years later and opened in 1992. The big question is why doesn't the motorway continue around Chester and then link up with the A494? It pretty much looks like a motorway, right? And yes, yes it does, the A55 has been built almost to motorway specification. It's lacking hard shoulders, but all of the junctions are to motorway standard. Back in the 1960s, there was the odd idea floating around about how the motorway could continue from junction 12 and link up possibly with the A494. Unfortunately though, I haven't found any evidence to support these rumours.
what a view of the Stanlo oil refinery. And there we are then, guys. That's all we've got time for this week. I hope you liked the video. If you did, there is, of course, a button specifically for that. And whilst you're there, you might as well try the subscribe button. That would be wicked sweet. Awesome. Enjoy the rest of your week, whatever it is you get up to. My name's John. You've been watching Auto Shenanigans, and I'll see you guys next time for another exciting episode of Secrets of the Motorway. Till then, take care. Bye-bye. You fell over there, didn't you see?